three speakers, uh, about 15 minutes apiece tonight, so let's give them the courtesy that we give all our speakers and uh, be quiet and respectful and keep your phones off and stay seated. Now let's hear from our first speaker tonight, Dennis. Welcome, Dennis. Guys, hey guys, my name is Dennis, and I'm out of Raleigh. There. You guys hear me right? Um, well, let's see. I just turned 60 last year. I was born April, 24, April 21, 1965, in California, San Pedro, California. Uh, my family was non-alcoholic. We had no drug addicts in our family at the time either. Um, we had alcoholics that visited our place. I was raised by my grandparents because my mother was a practicing alcoholic, but I was so young that I didn't realize that. My dad was a beer distributor for Ham's Enterprise, and he was there close to 20 years and retired or didn't retire, he went on to a different profession. Um, I was probably about five or six, I believe, when uh, my mother had taken me to my grandparents' house on my father's side and left me with them to be raised. They didn't, she didn't, uh, like she wanted uh, me or my sister or my brother at the time. She took my sister and my brother and dropped them off at her parents' house to be raised by her mother and father. <clears throat> so I had a lot of abandonment issues to deal with right off the bat when I was growing up. And uh, had a lot of PTSD also later on from drinking. I uh, started experimenting, uh, I'd say probably about 10 or 11 years old. And now when I think back, I see uh, well, everything alcoholic that was in me even at that age. I was isolating, didn't want to be around people. Um, I was truly an alcoholic at that age. The only thing I was missing was the alcohol. It wasn't until later, much later on when uh, I hit high school that I started drinking quite a bit. And I turned into a blackout drinker at a very early age. Um, I didn't know what it was like to have a few beers, relax, and kick back. I didn't know what that was like. But uh, it wasn't until I was about 30 years of age that um, I finally snapped out of it, so to speak. Um, I had to uh, I had to get sober. I was miserable. I couldn't figure out why I had to keep changing, starting over my life. I never could see the correlation in between alcohol and me having problems. I always thought it was the world and everyone around me. So it's taken me a long time to get to the point where I am right now. I've uh, been in, in and out of the program, uh, been involved with Alcoholics Anonymous for over probably 35, close to 40 years now. And, uh, and how it works, you know, it's rarely ever seen a person uh, fail who has not thoroughly followed our path um, I followed the path but I didn't surrender I never surrendered um, I worked construction I looked at it like I went to work every day paid my bills, I had trucks I had Harleys um, list went on and on I was a functioning alcoholic <clears throat> until that uh, functioning uh, ended when we had uh, that last depression I was out of work. Guys were calling me looking for work. I was calling other guys looking for work. And that's when my drinking really took off. That's when I checked into a treatment facility in Phoenix. And I was night manager at Crossroads West for over a year and a half. Um, I love that place. It saved my life at that point. But I wasn't, uh, I wasn't at peace with myself. I carried, a, carried all this abandonment issues and uh, I always swore that I would never do my children in the same way my parents had done to me, but in reality I had. I walked out on my kids. Um, 
His wife had kidnapped them both, took off on a run. We found them a couple of years later. My dad did. He kept my kids for five years. Didn't bother to tell me he had them that entire time. And uh, that took a toll on me. Um, that's where the heavy PTSD came in and play. Um, I had to... I had to figure out what was going on with me because I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't stay sober. I uh, do a couple treatment centers in Phoenix, you know, spin dry 28 days. And uh, finally, uh, one of the caseworkers there, she actually read my file and seen what all I'd been through. So then she recommended I come up here to Prescott and see uh, or check into. Uh, uh, D uh, was a decision point. So I went up there, still the same thing, 30 days spin dry out. Uh, see what I still need to work on. So I found uh, Compass Recovery Centers. Uh, they got some excellent, excellent therapists. Um, and that's where I've been for the last four months. You know, now I'm at peace with myself, at peace with others. My daughter is back in my life. She's given me five beautiful grandchildren. Um, it's all a direct result of just being willing to do whatever it takes, you know. I didn't like having to walk into these places, but I knew I needed to do it, you know. Um, I love my sponsor I got right now. I love Mike Bennett. He's my grand sponsor. Um, you know, these guys are awesome. Uh now I'm fortunate that um, I'm moving to the next level of where I'm at in, in Compass, and uh, so I'm afforded more time to work with the guys in there. You know, bring them up, kind of give them direction. Say, hey, you know, this is what I had to do. This is what you need to do if you want to change your life. And that's what this program's all about. Today I can walk with my head held high and a smile on my face. And I love going to the Sunday meetings, uh, especially with all the guys. Um, I love this program. It's definitely done for me what I could never do for myself. And uh, I have a conscious contact with God on a daily basis, all day. I get up early, 5 o'clock every morning. Go out, meditate, listen to the birds, and pray, talk to God. That's my time. So thank you for your time. I hope you guys have a great night. Next up we have Josh. Welcome, Josh. Nice, Josh. I'm an alcoholic. Sobriety date... Uh, <clears throat> 7 31 2023 i have a home group the sunday night round table which i love i have service commitments there at the round table a little fun fact which i learned from mike bennett the round table actually used to be part of the rarely group so i found that out from my grand sponsor mike bennett <laughs> my sponsor is right here mr kevin mclaughlin so grateful for him and Mike, Mike gave me a couple of pieces of advice before I got up here and spoke. You know, he said, Josh, make sure you use the F word profusely. And he said, wear tank top and flip flops. So I said, Mike, I don't think I should do that. Yeah, you know? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, yeah, so I had all the ingredients of an alcoholic at a very young age, you know, uh, irrational fear, loneliness, uh, feeling of not being worthy. You know, it was all there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and at a very young age, I looked for a solution to that problem, and I found that solution, and it was, it was alcohol. Before my 18th birthday, I had two underage drinking tickets and a DUI. My parents were very, very proud of me. Um, but what I learned really quick is that I needed to surround myself with people that were just like me. So when I moved out of my house at 18 years old, that's exactly what I did. I surrounded myself with people who drank like me. You know, there's drugs are part of my story who use drugs like me. You know, I wanted to be around people like me because that made me feel like my alcoholism was normal. 
I'll just tell you a quick story, and this should qualify me as an alcoholic. I went to, uh, <clears throat> I was 25 years old, went to uh, Rocky Point, Mexico, which if none of you have ever been there, it's like an alcoholic's paradise. It is like the, uh, all it is is drinking, it's everything's really cheap. Well, it was back when I used to go, you know, I'm old now, but back when I, back when I was 25, everything in Rocky Point was extremely cheap. So you go down there with 100 bucks and stay drunk for three days. Um, but I went with some friends, the friends I was talking about, friends who drank and used like me. And uh, we got down there, we unloaded the, unloaded the truck, you know, got it all into the condo. And we went out and hit the town, partying. And uh, it was probably 11, 12 o'clock. You know, I had met some people in the bar. I was just drinking. I could barely, I came in and out that whole night. But uh, my friends basically came to a point where like, Josh, we want to leave. And I said, I don't want to leave. And I refused to leave. And they left me at the bar. I ended up back at a condo with about 10 people that I had met at the bar. Never Didn't know who they were. But I was back there, you know, drinking all night with them. I think it was about 3 o'clock rolled around. I wandered into one of the bedrooms and passed out. And some guy woke me up and he's like, dude, I don't really know you. And I know we were drinking together, but you got to get the hell out of my house. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know who you are. I don't want you sleeping here. So I, I was on the other side of the point, if you've never been to Rocky Point, and our, our hotel, our condo was on the other side. Luckily, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning, there's not many taxi drivers around uh, Rocky Point. Luckily, there was a local there that was nice enough to let me jump in the back of his truck. He drove me over to, the, to my side of the, uh, the little point there, and, uh, and I was there. The problem was, is I was so drunk, I could not remember what our room number was. I had no clue. So I went around trying to knock on doors. They're like, no, dude, got the wrong one, got the wrong one. They're not here, no one here by that name. So I had the brilliant idea of going into a, uh, you know, I'm like, I can't find the room. Hopefully the car is unlocked. I'll go find the car, you know, sit in there, fall asleep, I'll be fine. So I get into what I thought was my car, uh, our car. It was a white SUV. I got in the back of it, you know, and I'm still buzzed. And I'm like, you know what I'll do? I had some uh, Bolivian marching powder on me, a.k.a. cocaine. So I thought I'd just do a little bump, you know, and then go find my room. You know, I will find my room. So I do a little bump, and I came to, and all of a sudden, I'm like, I don't remember our car having leather seats. And I reach over in the seat next to me. There's three cartons of cigarettes. I'm like, I don't remember anyone buying cartons of cigarettes. So I grabbed one of those cartons of cigarettes, got around, looked at the back of the car. I'm sitting in a Ford Navigator. We came in a Chevy Tahoe. So I'm sitting in somebody's car doing cocaine outside of the, the condo. At this point, I just said, you know what I'm going to do? And I went to every floor and I knocked on every door until I hit the door that was, that was mine. And like a good alcoholic, when I got there, I went to sleep, right? No, I did not. I got there, and I'm like, it's 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. We have a great view. I'm going to watch the sun come up. And I, we had stopped at the duty-free store, which if you don't know what that is, you know, the duty-free store, you can buy booze and cigarettes really cheap before you cross the border. I bought a whole bottle of Crown Royal. So, man, I was in heaven. I drank that Crown Royal, watched the sun came up, come up, and I drank and drank, and I didn't stop that entire trip. I remember the next morning. See, this is how you know you're a real alcoholic. When your friends who drink like you do are telling you, you have a problem. Because that's what they were all telling me the next morning. Josh, you've got a problem, man. You're out of control. You need help. I didn't want to hear that, you know. But, you know, I listened to what they had to say. And I, I decided to do something about it. The book of Alcoholics Anonymous, a lot of the times, you know, it, it talks about it in there. It says, you know, I used a, a sedative with which to taper off, right? That's in a lot of the stories, you know, it's, it's throughout the big book. And uh, that's what I decided I'd do because I had found that my sedative to use to taper off was Xanax. And luckily I was in Mexico. So all I had to do is walk across the street to the pharmacy and I bought a 90 pack of Xanax and boom, I went home in three days. I was out popping those pills every, you know, two hours, I guess. But this is how I drank, right? It was like all or nothing. And that was my thinking in everything. It was all or nothing in everything I did. 
either she loves me or she's cheating on me, right? Either I'm, you know, I'm going to go to the bar and have one drink. No, I'll have one drink. I'm getting wasted. If I'm drinking, I'm getting wasted. It was always, you know, extremes for me. And that's one thing this program has taught me is a balance, right? It's okay. You know, my highs aren't too high. My lows aren't too low now. And plus I have my sponsor to call when I really do get upset and he gets to hear all about it, you know, and he has, right? But, um, but yeah, so, um, I got home and, uh, I'm going to fast forward here for the sake of time. Uh, three DUIs, three months in jail and three years later and one month in prison, I ended up in my first rehab. And my first rehab was the Salvation Army Adult Rehabilitation Center down in Phoenix, Arizona. I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but it's like the Hilton of, uh, of rehabs. It is not. It is the worst possible rehab you could possibly be in in your entire life. It's a six-month program. You work for the Salvation Army processing donated goods, and you basically work for your recovery. You work for your room and board. You work for your three meals a day. A lot of people in there were uh, go there to not have to go to prison. 140-bed adult rehabilitation program. But you know what? When I was in prison, I was sitting in prison. Someone was telling me about that. And there was this gentleman who had brought a, a meeting into when I was in jail a month before that, brought a meeting in and he brought the, the book of Alcoholics Anonymous in, you know, and he, he had me read that, that part on page 21 about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you know, about how we build things up. We build up a bright future and then we just tear it down. And I had done that so many times before that I didn't want to do that anymore. So when I got out of prison, I checked myself into the Salvation Army on December 23rd of 2008. So two days before Christmas. I spent my, my Christmas, my first sober Christmas, I think, since I was probably like 13 years old at the Salvation Army. And um, I did the six-month program. I got a sponsor. The, actually, the sponsor I got was the gentleman who brought that meeting into the jail. He ended up coming to the Salvation Army to speak, and I asked him to be my sponsor. This guy knew the big book. He took me through the steps, and I wanted to get sober. But the problem was, I was young. I was, I mean, <laughs> relatively young. I was 28 years old, uh, but I had the mind of like a 17-year-old. You know, because I had been drinking and using since I, I'd never really lived like a life. I had all these jobs, bartending, serving, house to house. I'd meet somebody that had a room. You know, I was kind of like a nomad. I'd meet a girl. I'd go live with her. I was just, I never really had a responsible life. I don't think my name was on a lease until I was 33 years old, you know. Um, but anyway. So I did what they told me in that program, and I did what my sponsor told me, and I stayed there for the six months, and then I ended up getting a job there as the assistant resident manager for a year and a half, and I did that, and I did the deal. My sponsor and I started a meeting. I was an intergroup service rep. I did a lot of cool things, or a lot of cool things, you know, but I was putting in the work. It was just like, um, just like Wayne was saying, you know, it works if you work. You put in the work, you're going to get something back. And I was putting in the work and think my life was starting to get better. I decided I wanted to be the first person in my family to go to college. So I ended up enrolling in college. I ended up graduating from ASU, magna cum laude, you know, with a psychology degree. And I was going to be a counselor and I was going to save this world. But the thing was, is the more I got things back, you know, four years of sobriety, five years of sobriety, I started drifting away from the program. I got a great job. I was a youth pastor with the Salvation Army for a while um, at the Croc Center, which is this really cool center that they built in South Phoenix. And uh, it was great. My life was getting really good. And I took this job in, in California, which my sponsor said, don't do it, man. I know you're seven years sober, but I don't think you're ready to do that. I would stay here. And I said, yeah, what do you know? You know? And I did it anyway at seven years sober. And the, I did not get connected when I got out there. I started to, uh, I started in another school out there, continued education. And I was elected president of my class, right? So I had all these pressures and all these things starting to build up again. My dad was dying of cancer in Phoenix while I was in California. I got engaged 
we were planning the wedding and we had the chapel reserved in Hawaii. Invitations were starting to go out. And the problem is, is when you have all these things happening at once, good things or bad things, it doesn't matter for me. It's a lot of things and they created a lot of stress and a lot of problems. And I never got connected when I got to California because I thought, you know, I've been sober long enough, I got this. And that's the thing I really learned is that I never got this. Never, ever, ever, ever. If I, those words ever come out of my mouth, just slap me. Um, but uh, yeah, so things started. My dad passed away here in Phoenix. Um, pressures got too much, and I ended up picking up a drink. It didn't take me long. It took me about six months to lose all those things that I gained over those past seven years. Uh, fiance tried to stick with me. That didn't work out. I had a job gone. You know, back in a rehab at seven, six months sober. And, uh, you know, it was pride and ego that took me out. It was pride and ego that kept me out because I stayed out for seven years. And um, even though I was out, I don't have any exciting stories to tell in those seven years, though. None. Because I was an isolator after that, you know. I would drink to the point, all right, so this is just an example. So this is the example of the prog progression of the illness. So prior to getting sober in 2008, I had been to one rehab and one detox. After relapsing, I had been in five hospitals and six detoxes in seven years. So you tell me if, if that's progression or not. Because every time I drank, I went all the way. I usually didn't drink for long. It was usually only a week or two. But man, I tell you, after that week or two, if I didn't get medically detoxed, I'd probably die. I'd drink myself up to a point four, you know? So, uh, but even in those seven years, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I still say this, saved my life. Because every time I relapsed, it would only be for about two weeks, I'd get right back in the program. I'd get six months, nine months sober, but I could never fully surrender. It was my pride and ego that would not allow me to re-surrender. Every time it came up to like getting your month, my month chip, my two months, I am not picking up that chip because I should have eight years. And this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I know more than him. All right, this is where my mind kept going to. And it was a horrible, horrible, miserable place to be. So... Yeah, in and out of the program for seven years. I'd get close to a year, relapse. I'd get nine months, I'd relapse. I'd get six months, I'd relapse. But I'd always get right back in this program and get a sponsor until I didn't. Uh, about two years ago, three years ago now, I decided that I didn't need the program of Alcoholics Anonymous anymore. What I really, I found the answer. And it was uh, the California sober, man. It was the... Pot's legal now, right? So I'm going to try that. Maybe that'll keep me sober. And it did for a year. It did for a year. And then straight downhill after that. One day I decided I'm going to pick up a drink with this. And races were on. I ended up in a detox up here because I had moved to Prescott Valley um, in 2021, 2022. I had moved to Prescott Valley. I ended up in Royal Detox. I said, I'm going to get out. Did the seven days in there. I'm going to start going to meetings. I know what to do. Three months later, I was in another detox. And that's when I had a spiritual experience. You know, I finally came to a point where, you know, Bill always says you can't explain a spiritual experience, and I can't explain it. But what I can say is that my attitude and outlook on life changed drastically very quickly. Because I had worked this program before and I knew there was an answer to where I was. I was so mentally exhausted and tired. I could not do this anymore. I couldn't do it anymore. I was going to drive myself crazy. Because all the things I was trying to like line up. Okay, I can drink this day. I can Monday's easy, man. I don't even have to work. You know, I work from home. So I just go and move my mouse like every hour just to make sure, you know, people knew I was there. You know, so I like had all these plans to like, you know, to keep my drinking and and relationships, forget about it. Because I didn't care about relationships at this point with anybody. 
At this point, I'm like, I have my relationship. It's with alcohol and drugs. It makes me feel better. And I'm going to do whatever I can to maintain that. Anyway, it got mentally exhausting. So when I was in that detox, my ears opened, my eyes opened. I started listening, listening to every word that everyone said, whether it be in the detox or in the uh, meetings that were brought in. And uh, I didn't stop. I got into uh, rehab up here, Silver Sands. I got my sponsor the next day I was there, and we started to get to work. I worked all the way through the fifth step before I was out of there after 30 days, and I have not stopped since. I have multiple commitments. I have three sponsees, which it's an absolute blessing to have sponsors. I've been sponsoring people since I was three months sober, and it just always works out to where I have like three sponsees. That's like the magic number for me. You know, one will go away, one pops up. But those guys keep me sober. Working with those guys keep me sober, whether it be a reflection of what I don't want to go back to or just insight, that it, because that's the thing, is like insight comes from everywhere, and I didn't understand that before. It always had to come from somebody who had done this for a long time or knew what they were doing. You know what I mean? It can come from anywhere, from anybody at any time, and that's what I've really learned. That's one of the things I've learned. So, yeah, I got to work on the steps uh, you know, and I finally surrendered, step one, 100% in. And the main thing for me is that if I pick up a drink, I will die. That is engraved in me now. And it's not like, I don't think I'm just going to pick up one drink and then just drop dead. But I will die spiritually. I will die spiritually, and that will eventually lead to an alcoholic death with no one around me, with people saying, he could have been. He could have been. You know, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that. <clears throat> There's this quote um, that I love, and it says, um, <clears throat> it says, if you change the way you look at life, the life you look at changes. And that's what the program of Alcoholics Anonymous has done for me. It's shown me that I can live a different way and have a life in and outside of these rooms, I, work, I have a great job. I work for a Fortune 500 comp company, and I'm a convicted felon. You know? That doesn't come from me. That comes from God. You know? So it has given me a spiritual connection with a higher power that I could not even imagine. Most days, I wake up, and I am serene and peaceful. There are things that come my way that tick me off and make me angry, and that's what I have my sponsor for. <laughs> One of the reasons. Because I reach out to him immediately. Sometimes I'll hold on to it for a couple of days because I want to stew in it. But eventually I'm going to call him and talk to him about it. Um, but yes, it says in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change, right? So if you change the way you look at life, the, the life you look at changes. So it has changed the way I look at life. And in turn, it has made me realize that um, this life is worth living. And it's a blessing. So thank you so much for letting me share. And last tonight we have David. Welcome, David. All right. My name is David. I'm an alcoholic. It's just crazy being up here. Um, thinking about 17 months ago, this would be, yeah, not possible at all. Um, looking out here at some of the people that have helped me along this way, I'm just so grateful. Mike, thank you for asking me to do this. Um, you were one of the people that tried helping me a couple of years ago when I was first getting started in this. It was at uh, Shepherd on the Hill at noon meeting, and I was drunk once again at a noon meeting and getting ready to leave and you grabbed my arm and said just stay and I couldn't um, I wasn't ready for it but you doing that and everybody else trying to help me through this process you know and you helped me find my bottom that shame and that guilt and uh, you know because it was another person that I let down once again um, but yeah my sobriety date is uh, April 2nd, 2023. Um, I wish that I could say that was the first time that I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and I got it, but no, that's not the case at all. Um, 
I was introduced to this program about 10 years ago. Um, I was a mess. And uh, my drinking st- my drinking started when I was about 13. Um, the way I drink, I drink to get drunk. That's just how it was. Um, the only thing that changed was how frequently I did it. And it progressed through high school and through college. And I would say it was probably about... I don't know, my late 20s when I crossed that invisible line um, where I guess you'd say the strange mental twist, I had acquired it. Um, And I could no longer safely drink alcohol and I could no longer think like the reality of it, like that's all I thought about. Um, It was terrible. And it caused me to lose two careers, um, a relationship that I thought... uh, was going to last forever. That didn't happen. Um, And I was suicidal. And living with my parents again at the age of, I want to say, 30, 31. Um, My timeline's off just because I've done some serious damage to my thinking and my brain. Um, My memory isn't quite what it used to be. But, uh, yeah, that night pistol in my mouth um and i realized i couldn't go go through with it but i wanted somebody to open that door just to startle me into pulling that trigger and uh that didn't happen and thank god um the next morning i woke up asked my dad to uh take me to a doctor i needed help and that's what we did we went to a doctor and doctor told me he goes hey you know what man i can help you with your problem i go okay he goes but you know, under one circumstance, I go, I'll do anything he asked me to do. He goes, I need you to go to AA for the next 30 days and you need to do it right after you leave here. So I made him that promise. Um, and for the next 30 days, um, I went to AA and that man helped save me. He, he saved me basically. And I got into the program. I probably lasted for about three months. And I couldn't relate with anybody. I did not think I was an alcoholic. Um, I didn't want to believe I was an alcoholic. It was just, uh, yeah, I thought I was different. I thought I could handle this thing on my own. And I did pretty good um, for five years. You know, I didn't have a drink. And life got a lot better, a lot better. Um, I was able to create a business with my brother that uh still very successful just not a part of it um we'll get to that uh you know um fell in love again got married um but uh, i still didn't know how to handle life in life situations and it was just a matter of time before uh i was going to go back to my old ways and it wasn't alcohol that started it this time it was um you know what do you call it peruvian marching powder I call it Colombian Bam Bam. Um, that's what I got into to begin with. Um, but if I put one in my system, I turn into a walking trash can for all of them. Um, and alcohol was right around the corner. And I was hiding it. I was living a double life. I knew what I was doing was wrong. Um, and I was still trying to maintain this, uh, this, this idea that I'm, I'm sober to everybody. And it got to the point where I just couldn't... I couldn't keep up with the lies anymore. And yeah, I eventually got caught by my wife, who's now my ex-wife. Um, and shortly thereafter, her and her daughter had left. Um, and yeah, I started to fall apart even more. My drinking increased significantly. And, you know, I kept on saying it like, you know, I can handle this. I've quit before. And that's not the case. And I would tell people, I, hey, I know how bad this can get. Um, that's not the case either. I had no clue. Uh, and it turned out like uh, I kept drinking and I was at work. And my brother and I happened to get into an argument about what I was doing. And that ended up in a fist fight out in front of our office. And that was pretty much the end of anything good that I still had going in my life. Uh, My parents stopped talking to me at that point. Um, Yeah, and I was a loose cannon. I went wild for a couple months there. um, Ran from all my problems. 
It's wild. Looking back on it, I just can't believe it. Um, but finally, I got back into town after about a three-month run, and uh, they told me I needed to, uh, if I wanted to come around again, I needed to get some help. So, you know, at that point in time, I was like, okay, knowing that I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to quit drinking. Um, but I went to recover, like it was a treatment facility down in Phoenix. It was a 30 day inpatient and it cost me 30 grand to go there. And I didn't really get anything about recovery. What I did get was an education on how to take psych meds. Um, so there added another problem. As soon as I got out of that facility, it was on. Um, I lasted probably about, I'd say a month to two months and it was worse than ever. Now I was using cocaine, drinking profusely, and using psych meds, thinking that would balance everything out. Um, I was wrong, very wrong. And it got worse. My drinking increased uh, to the point of where um, every morning it would wake me up. About two, three o'clock in the morning, it was like it was an automatic alarm clock for me. And I would start drinking vodka straight from the bottle. Uh, and usually that was, that was the only way I could maintain or function. It, like, it, it was just terrible. And that's how life persisted for a while. And it just progressively got worse. And the only way that I could stop was with some sort of medical intervention. Um, and I ended up in the hospital multiple occasions. And then the big one was, which I swore I would never go to, was voluntary commitment to asylums. Um, yeah, ended up in one of those facilities multiple times. And the first time I went in, um, I, shortly thereafter, I was drinking again. The second time I went in, um, I was just a mess. I couldn't, uh, my body wasn't healing anymore. I had cuts and scrapes all over me. It was just, it was terrible. Um, I was outright mentally defective. It was, it was bad. Um, but during this period, I had been coming to AA also. And I had sponsors. Um, I was getting chips. Like, I could last for a period of time. And then just something would happen. I, like, it was bad. I remember my first sponsor, he told me, he goes, Dave, you're just not ready. And I, would ha I had had the bottle in my hand as he's telling me this on the phone. And I'm still drinking and telling him, hey, I'm ready. You know, like, what the hell? What are you talking about? Um, he was right. He was right. But I knew I had to surrender, and for some reason, that last time in that psych ward, uh, that's when it happened. About five days into it, I finally came to, and I was sitting in the bed, and the mental chaos had started again. The mental chaos had started again, and um, I was just like, okay, we need to do something here. Uh, we need to get out of this place. Um, and as soon as we do, we need to get into the program. We need to beg that man to take us through the steps. And that's what I did. Um, I surrendered to this program. The gift of desperation is what saved me. A group of drunks is what saved me. And what they told me was good orderly direction is what you need to follow. Um, I worked the steps the first time. I had no clue what I was doing, but it worked because I'm still sober. I got a new sponsor now that uh, is taking me through the book, and it's just amazing how much things have changed with my thinking and what I can understand. Um, I think I'm almost done here, so I'll just wrap this up. Um, I'm forever grateful for this program. Uh, if you're new, please keep coming back, or what they told me was stay. That was the big one for me. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Thank you.